Yeah, so welcome to um, this presentation of Beginner's Guide to Upland Birds. Um, so I, it is a beginner's guide. Um, I'm not I'm not an expert per se. Um, yeah, you know, you're only an expert if you know one more person, uh, one more thing than the next person. Sorry, I've just got a few people waiting to come in. Um, so um, yeah, hopefully it's not going to be too much information, information overload, but um, yeah, it's, um, I just hope that you, you know, get something out of it and you can use those, the information from the um, presentation and put it into practice. So um, this um, uh, presentation is, has been brought to you by Gwent Wildlife Trust um, with, um, in partnership with the um, South East Wales Resilient Uplands uh, Partnership with funding from the Welsh Government's Rural Communities Rural Development Programme and the European Union's European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development. I definitely had to look at my notes for that because it's a bit of a mouthful, but um, yeah, so this is a partnership project um, for South East Wales Resilient Uplands, but I work for Gwent Wildlife Trust. Um, my name is Robert McGee. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science in Ecology and Conservation. Um, after graduating, I um, started working for the uh, Red Kites of Ceredigion project with the RSPB in Mid Wales. Um, I that coincided with the filming of BBC Spring Watch that was at that time in 2012 being filmed at Ennis Here uh, Nature Reserve. So I was actually on reserve while the filming was taking place. Um, was able to help out with the visitors, uh, guided walks and tours. Um, introducing people to the presenters and things like that, which was very interesting. Um, I think someone's just knocked on my door, but I'm sure my partner will answer it. Um, so, yeah, and then I worked at Newport Wetlands uh, between 2013 um, and 2017, uh, leading lots of guided walks, uh, styling murmuration walks, um, bearded tit guided walks, things like that. So I got to know uh, a lot of wetland birds, lowland birds. Um, and yeah, and then I started working for Gwent Wildlife Trust in 2017. I'm currently working as Youth Engagement Officer uh, for Stanford Nature Wales Project, which is a climate action project uh, based in Edinburgh. And I also work on other projects such as the South East Wales Resilient Uplands. I've done a pollinator project uh, called Perfect, Perfect Pollinators um, as well. So that's a little bit about me. Um, Yes, so what I'm about to talk about is a sort of a, a mixture of things that I've um, developed professionally, but also personally. Um, excuse me a second. Um, I don't know everything there is to know about birds. Um, in fact, in, there, are about, there are more than 10,000 species of bird worldwide, uh, so it's I'm not saying that it's not possible to know them all. I'm sure someone out there does, but yeah, it's 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 just my love for nature and my passion. I you know I've been pretty much birding since I was uh, well, pretty much since about eighteen. Uh, so for about eighteen years now. Um, so what I found though is working in in the nature conservation industry is people want to know how and why and when. So I, I kind of. I've been able to answer a lot of questions as I've gone along um, and so what I'm basically teaching or sort of talking about tonight is going to be based on what actually people have asked me and so effectively this is you know uh, just another way of looking at it uh, from my point of view but also what I've learned um, um, through my job and uh, personally going out and bird watching. Um, so let's have a look if this will work now if I can do this. There you go. So, first thing I want to talk about is, um, so, sorry, this is just um, a guide to what um, I'm going to talk about this evening. So the first thing I will talk about is the code of conduct and etiquette. It's sometimes left out of bird watching talks and, and walks, but I think it's, it's really important, especially these days, um, you know, where birding and wildlife watching has become a very popular pastime. Um, and I think um, it's important to look at code of conduct. A little bit about equipment, binoculars, 
cameras, books, and things like that. Um, I'm going to first of all talk about bird basics. I think what you can learn from birds in general, um, you can apply to any any area of bird watching, whether it be upland or lowland, uh, woodland, wetland. Uh, you know. So it's um, I'm going to go back to basics first, then I'm going to go into a bit of detail, well, a lot of detail about upland birds. Um, <clears throat> we're going to listen to some bird song, not all of bird song, but um, some of the more some of the birds that are identical, uh, difficult to identify visually. We're going to listen to some of the song. Um, the upland birds that I'm going to be talking about this evening are predominantly um, found in Gwent and surrounding areas. It would be very difficult to go talk about all upland birds uh, in in the UK. Um, so it's going to be things that either you know um, are found in Gwent or breed. Um, in the uplands of Gwent, but then maybe sort of over or over winter in other in other areas. And then I'm going to go into a few details about birds at Silent Valley, uh, ready for the walk on Saturday. And then, like I say, we'll open up for questions at the end. Um, so this is the RSPB Code of Conduct, which is pretty much adopted by all nature conservation organisations, including the BTO, uh, British Trust for Ornithology, and the Wildlife Trusts. Um, so the first thing is avoiding just avoid disturbing birds and their habitats. The bird interests should always come first. I think you know I think that's true. Um, you know, really of all wildlife, not necessarily birds. You don't want to deliberately disturb any wildlife. Um, you know, don't want to get too close. Um, stick to footpaths um, if you can. And um, obviously, you know, in some wild areas, footpaths are not necessarily um, there. But um, you know. You don't want to be jumping out or flushing birds, um, especially not tape luring, which is when you play the bird song in order to attract the bird, because that is a sign of that's territorial behaviour that you're introducing there. And if a male hears that, then that male is going to become aggressive, which puts it in a vulnerable position because it may come out of hiding in order to defend its territory, which then puts it in sort of position of being protected. So you don't want to use tape luring. Um, yeah, so you want to be an ambassador for bird watching, you know, you want to respond positively to passers-by while you're wildlife watching, say hello, uh, using local services, shops, nature reserves and things like that. Um, know the law and rules of visiting the countryside following the countryside code. So, you know, all wildlife is protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act of 1981. So, you know, that is the law. You shouldn't harm deliberately any, any wildlife shouldn't be really approaching nests or disturbing nests because that is illegal unless licensed to do so. Um, you know, think about the interests of wildlife, number four here now, think about the interests of wildlife uh, and local people before passing on uh, information about rare bird, especially during the breeding seasons. Social media now is, you know, it is a really good way of finding out about wildlife, but just be cautious about, you know, passing on information, particularly about schedule one, breeding birds, which is the highest protection uh, order of, um, of, of birds in the UK. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a few instances where, um, you know, a barn owl in a, in a location that I won't mention recently has been the subject of this sort of behaviour where people are sort of crossing fences and, and things to get close to, to take a photograph. Um, be nice and respectful to people, be quiet at bird hides, um, you know, volunteer and support your local nature conservation organisations. I think this is really important. I mean, whenever I go birding, um, you know, I get talking to people, as I'm passing people by, they might sort of say, oh, you know, there's, there's a particular bird in this area if you want to look, which is great, you know, be friendly and pass on information. Um, and it's, it's always nice to, to sort of know that people that are giving that information out on nature reserves are sometimes volunteers themselves so volunteer for your nature conservation uh, organization um so and the last one on that sort of section birds are wild animals they're not for display purposes i think we need to remember this they're not it is nice to get photographs of birds but um you know <laughs> they're not there for the actual purpose um so you know just be cautious and be careful while photographing birds and lastly on here is send your sightings to the county recorder or um, which um, the county bird recorder is Daryl Spittle. Um, you can get his information on the Ornithological Society 
uh, website. And um, also another one there is SUBREC, which is Southeast Wales Biodiversity Record Centre. Uh, there are There is a national record centre, and then they're split up regionally. Um, however, I put all mine into the LERC app, which is the Local Environmental Record Centre Wales app. Um, so I take photos of these you know, on my phone and post them uh, on the app. You know, it's really important. It's all good. And you know, where I'm good in a fantastically good quality photo. Uh, but if if you know if that just goes onto a calendar or your desktop screensaver, then that's nice enough. But I feel that you know it is good to notify your local record centre because it's really important to know where wildlife is, not not just not just birds. Uh, just this is my uh, Subrec um, page. Uh, this is a screenshot from a while back now when I first sort of started doing uh, bird watching presentations. Uh, but you can see there, th and this is an ideal way of keeping your, you know, for your own personal benefit, keeping a record of what you've seen and um, and what you you know and where you've seen it. So um, the top one there is Ring Oozel. I saw that um, on the British, which is. Um, sort of uh, Tallywine uh, in between Abersacken and Pondypool. Um, Hummingbird Hawkmoth I've got on there. What else? Raven. I've not actually got a photo of it. You don't need a photo to upload your records. But uh, a raven there and a comma butterfly and a painted lady butterfly. So, you know, and then on the map, it just in, I've got the indicators of where I saw those things. So it's just, you know, it's you a record, but that also goes to the local record centres and they have proof of where wildlife is. Um, so uh, a little bit about handy equipment. Um, so the three there have a little asterisk uh, next to it because they are not essential. Um, they do cost money, but your eyes and ears are much more important than useful. In fact, I nine times out of ten hear a bird before um, I see it, and so you know. And then even then, trying to get a Binocular on it if it's moving quite quickly is extremely difficult. But um, binoculars are handy. Um, I have a set which I've had for 12 years now. Um, so, you know, if you get a sort of fairly decent pair, um, they will last you a while. These are Viking um, uh, binoculars. These are what I would say they're uh, sort of mid range. These are Viking Navalux. So um, the um, the spec is 10 by 42. Just hold on, I don't know if you can see that, but it says 10 by 42. So 10 is the magnification level, and then the 42 is the uh, diameter diameter of the objective lens in millimeters. That's 42 millimeter across. So you can get small lenses and large lenses. And then the other number on there, which says 5.8, is the field of view. So when you look out the binoculars, you've got a 5.8 degree uh, angle. Um, these have lasted me well. Um, the only thing is, is that they do start to degrade a little bit, particularly the moving part. So this is starting to sort of not hold up anymore. It starts to fall. I mean, that'll, I can tighten that, that's fine. Um, also the eye pieces, um, mine have broken because they just weigh it down. So they start to flop. So I've actually put a hair bobble around those to hold those up, uh, but you know, um, because I, the eyepiece um, is to help with um, uh, people wear glasses. So the eyepiece should be down if you wear glasses, because then the distance you need you need to, between your eye and the eyepiece uh, is created by your glasses. But I don't wear glasses, so I lift the eye uh, up, which creates the distance that you need between your eye and the eyepiece. That's a little bit about binoculars. Um, telescopes are handy. Um, they, do, they are a bit tricky to, to lug around. Uh, but for wetland areas, they are handy because some birds are, you know, low tide, uh, miles away. Uh, so that, that you know, can be handy. Uh, camera. Now, I, I don't have a camera with a huge uh, photo, uh, photo lens and these huge things which cost thousands of pounds. In fact, the most the camera I use, use the most often is uh, on my phone. Body is excellent on phone these days. And now even the zoom is very good. Uh, so uh, for me, I just want a record. I don't necessarily want a really sharp crystal image. But I do the other camera I have is uh, just a small Canon D 
digital camera. This has a zoom of about 19 times on it, which actually, if something within 50 meters, that can pretty much get a decent uh, photograph of it. And then I do have a sort of larger digital camera. This is a Panasonic Lumix, uh, but again, it doesn't have a huge uh, lens on it. Um, it's um, but the zoom is fairly decent. The main thing I use this for is actually filming. It's got it's a 4K camera, so very high definition. I think that sometimes you can get more out of uh, film than bird movement, the sound. Uh, so I tend to, to film those rather than photograph them, uh, which is why in this um, presentation, most of the photographs are by my colleague Andy Caron, who's an excellent. Um, ecologist and so some of those are fantastic. Um, notepad and a pencil, um, I think, you know, that can be handy. I used to take a notepad and pencil around the area because the list of birds I've seen were, were, were enormous. Uh, sometimes if I went for a long walk, actually, like I said, again, I put things into my phone, I have a notepad on my phone now. Um, but, uh, you know, because otherwise you forget, you know, you really do see a lot more than you think. Um, you come back if you write them down, you've seen 30 to 40 birds, whereas actually sometimes you only remember about 10 of them. Um, an ID book uh, or guide. Now, I've got uh, loads of books because friends and relatives know that I like bird watching, and so they, they buy me all sorts of books. But actually, what I found is the book I bought when I was at university, uh, which is this one. I hope you can see that okay, which is the uh, New, well, but not so new anymore. But Birdwatcher's Pocket Guide to Britain and Europe. Um, size is okay; that can fit in my pocket. It has to go in my backpack. Uh, so this is uh, by Peter Heyman and Rob Hume. Um, it's got 430 species. Now that for me is quite important because, as a beginner, you may just be, you know, looking at um, UK birds, but as you start to develop and turn into an intermediate, you, you go bird watching more frequently, you do tend to see m m less common birds. Um, so things, rarer birds and things that are coming over from Europe, uh, uh, sorry, from the continent of Europe, uh, occasionally or passing migrants. So some birds, uh, books like the RSPB, British Book for Birds, um, British Birds Book is handy, uh, in fact, for information because They've got guides, um, map guides, you know, really good description of the birds and pictures, uh, colour pictures. But actually, now and again, so this has got 272 birds in it. And every now and again, you're going to see a bird that's not in this book. So I tend to go for the European, uh, Britain and European uh, bird books, just because um, I find it a bit more useful. But I always do, you know, I do refer to that one now and again. But this one, so is the Collins Bird Guide, um, which uh, has got, I think, how many birds has this got? I think it's got 800 in it. But this, even though the descriptions aren't as thorough as the RSPB book, it just is excellent. And the, the drawings, and it has a variety of pictures, birds in flight, uh, stationary, male, female. Uh, so I really, you know, these two are my uh, sort of favourite books. It's not necessarily the brand uh, per se, uh, but I would go for a European uh, rather than just British birds uh, because ones like this are handy, a sort of really tiny pocket, and that's got uh, 230 birds. So again, you might find that one's in pocket that you, that you, that's not in your, in your book. Um, so yeah, phone app. So an app for everything these days, but um, if, if you really don't want to carry a book around, there are plenty of apps with, um, with bird guides uh, on them. Uh, lists, so I used to keep a paper list of all the birds. I didn't do a yearly list, uh, an annual list. I just used to do a life uh, list, so all the birds I've seen in my life. And then I put them into uh, a paper uh, version. And then I had an app and I could put them all into my app. The only thing is, when I, looked, when I got a new phone, they didn't transfer, so I lost all the information. So uh, I, in that case, I'd probably stick to a, 
uh, a paper uh, a book a list. It's just a simple, uh, you write down what species you've seen, where and when, just so you've got a record yourself. But like I say, the, the Subrec website is really handy because that's pretty much become my, my list now. Anyway, super clothing for the weather. Um, so obviously, you know, it's just about playing on the day. However, what I will say is certain um, locations, the weather can change dramatically. In upland areas in particular, when you get up on top, uh, compared to down below, it can be very windy. Also, you have little microclimates. Uh, it's a, a sign of valley nature, because it is quite a narrow valley. There are certain areas of the woodland where the temperature just drops because the, the sunlight doesn't reach it, and it can be like walking into a fridge. So just be aware of what, you, you know, what you're going into and, and be prepared. Uh, take water all the time. You know, my birding trips tend to be if I can all day hours, but generally there'll be hours. And so I'm taking food and, and, and you know and water and a uh, hot drink with me. Now the chair for me is a key uh, thing because I tend to find a location to sit rather than continuously walking. So um, a little co um, collapsible chair that I've attached to my work stack I find weird, just a small thing. If not, I usually have a, a tote a canvas shopping bag one of the ones that's just the, the cotton uh, bag that's you can fold it quite easily just i can fold it up and put it on uh somewhere just to make it a bit more comfortable whether it be uh, a bench or um a log or the ground uh, just to give it a, just to give me a bit more comfort uh so we're going back to basics now um so it's quite a long description here about what a bird is. This is a beginner's guide, and I'm sure I don't mean to patronise anyone. I'm sure you all know what a bird is, but this is just where it sits in, uh, you know, in the tree of life, uh, if you like. Uh, just to give you um, an idea, I'm not going to read it out word for word. I'll give you a bit of time just to, to digest that. But um, you know, they, they are not all birds fly, but they generally would have at, at some point. Um, so obviously there are birds that exist that don't fly, penguins, ostrich, simply because they've 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 evolved to not have to fly. They've not really they you know they've not um, they don't have the need to fly away from predators. Unfortunately, humans are becoming a predator these days, so that's why some have become extinct. But um, that you know there are like I said earlier, there are ten thousand more than ten thousand living species. Um, so you know there are a lot uh, taken. Um, yeah, I'll just leave that there for a um, the second while I have a sip. And of course, the birds that I'm talking about this evening are wild birds, not captive birds. Um, like I said, this has been recorded, so um, if you want to look back at this, you, you, you can. So, um, yeah, the other thing to add is that in the UK, um, so there's 10,000 species worldwide. In the UK, to date, uh, so the British Ornithologist Union are the, the, the official um, uh, body that decides whether a, a record is genuine. Uh, so birds are submitted, um, like I say, through record centres with photos, but it's the British um, Ornithologist, Union, Ornithologist Union that decide whether the bird is genuine and not captive, for example. But um, now, when I started doing uh, this presentation, is a variation of one I did previously. Um, so, in uh, on the first of January, twenty twenty, the UK list all species recorded uh, was at six hundred and nineteen, and so they'll include one. You know, obviously, all the birds that we are familiar with. But if one sighting, one record, is um, uh, a genuine photograph and it's accepted. Uh, by the uh, the B uh, B O U, then that goes on the list. But as of no, 29th of November 2021, the list uh, was actually at 628. So there's new birds arriving in the UK all the time, uh, particularly as the climate is warming. Um, just thinking back to you know the 60s and 70s, uh, there was a bird called the Chetty's warbler was not present in the UK. Uh, but as the climate, uh, it's a Mediterranean bird predominantly, but as the climate has warmed, they have moved further north. It is now considered a resident bird in the UK, uh, and there are 
particularly in the south of the UK, it's not quite got uh, north, but in South Wales, particularly Newport, Wetlands, Mega Marsh, uh, reserves that are, there are plenty of uh, chase warblers. Again, you often hear them before you see them, but that's an example of how things are moving and changing. As, as the climate does change, there are new sightings uh, being recorded in the UK all the time. The thing with that figure, 628, is that is the total number that's being that's, that have been recorded. If I'm honest, it's the figure of regular birds, not just entirely resident, but summer visitors, winter visitors, is more like 250 to 230 regularly seen birds in the, uh, in the UK. Uh, so bird uh, topography, or parts of the bird, bird anatomy, if you like, um, this is a quite detailed picture. I don't want you to think too much into this, uh, but there are various parts. And this will, you know, this is, uh, I'm not actually sure what species this is, it's a finch of some sort, but um, this will vary. There, there are other birds that might have different features, like uh, ducks might have slightly different features. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the key things that I want you to think about really is the head, the beak, uh, the breast, wings, rump, tail and legs. So they are the key things to look out for that vary dramatically. And another one, which is my favourite, is the supercilium, which is the white uh, I haven't even seen my cursor here, but it's the white on this bird, the white area above the eye, above the eye stripe. Uh, this is a really good feature I find with birds that can, you know, you can really tell the difference between some, some similar species. Uh, uh, so the eye stripe runs from the eye, uh, sometimes through it, so you get uh, another eye on the other side. The supercilium is, a, for me, is a key is a key feature. Um, and I'm going to kind of prove that with this photo. So there's two British species of bird. One is a UK resident, the other is a winter visitor in some areas of the UK is right this year or year round. Uh, very similar in size, shape and features. Um, in fact, the exact same size. Um, but if you look at the wings, very similar. Colour does vary slightly, but um, the key feature for me there is, um, is the supercilium, which is just above the eye stripe. And you've got a little uh, patch of white under the eye here as well. Because the thing with the fire crest is that in theory it has an orange crest uh, and a gold crest has a yellow one mainly, but actually the colour in both areas you can see is very similar and the dark uh, stripes uh, the either side of the orange there. But that for me is such a key feature, that is the difference between, you know, for me anyway, um, as an experienced birder, I've tell the difference between uh, a gold crest and a fire crest. Um, so the biometrics of a bird. Now this is quite interesting because um, what you'll find in a uh, a bird book. Sometimes it won't give you all the information. It won't give you the it won't give you the length, the wingspan, uh, the length of the the legs, the length of the beak, and you know, and its weight. It generally gives you one figure. So in the RSPB um, book, um, it gives you one. Sorry, just give me a second. Uh, it just gives you one uh, figure. So. For, for example, uh, teal, which is duck, it says 38, uh, 34 to 38 centimetres. That's actually the full length of the bird uh, from beak to the tip of the tail. Um, and, you know, so that's, this is done by measuring dead birds, by the way. They let their place on their back with the head back so that you get the full, full length of the bird. And actually, that can be quite misleading because in the case of the long tail tip, which is the photo of there, nine, uh, the full length of the bird is 14 and a half centimetres, but actually nine centimetres of that is the tail. So it can be a bit misleading, particularly with birds with long beaks, things like curlews, which have got a really long beak and long tails. So don't read into it too much when you see a figure uh, uh, of the length of the bird. So just you need to think about things like that, because obviously a long tail tip it is a small bird uh, in proportion uh, with its, uh, its um, tail length there. Um, so, yes. Now, the easiest way 
to really identify a bird is comparisons. So because the other thing is that uh, live birds and the other things that really we're looking at are not as obliging as dead birds. You can, like I say, you can lay a dead bird on its back to measure it. Um, but um, the, the way that we describe um, sort of an overall observation of a bird is known as the jizz. Now, this is a term that was coined, and I just want to get this right, because it, it, it is sometimes confused um, with uh, G, G-I-S-S, jizz, which stands for General Impression, Size and Shape, which is a military term for describing aircraft. Um, so the jizz is an overall observation, but it's just not to be confused on. But it's just an easy way of remembering it. Uh, so this term was coined in 1921 by an Irish ornithologist, uh, the jizz of the bird, which just means the overall uh, impression, size, uh, and shape, and movement as well. So, for example, a good way of describing that is it was bigger than a robin, uh, but smaller than a blackbird, uh, and flew um, flew like a pigeon or a wood pigeon, and was the same colour as a female mallard. So in this case, um, in, you know, you may be talking about the dunlin uh, there, which is... Um, which is um, being compared in this instance with a dotterel and a, a gold plug. But you can see there, and this is a guide taken from the uh, BTO, uh, BTO's website, they are using birds, uh, more common birds, as a way of uh, compa comparison as well. So pigeon, robin, and uh, uh, yeah, ducks are sometimes used, mallard, blackbird is often used, starling, uh, things like that. Um, so the way that they move as well. So is it easier to identify a bird while it's still or in flight? Well, at close range when they are still, sometimes, but actually when they when they move, sometimes the way they fly is a bit easier. So I, I love this this uh, picture by Lev uh, Perichian, who was a nature author and, and bird. Uh, and you can see there, a uh, blackbird is a direct line, a wren also flies pretty much in a straight line, really fast wing beat. Uh, blue tit, green woodpecker, actually that's the same for a lot of woodpeckers, uh, great spot woodpecker in particular. Very fast wing beat, a glide, which then dips, and then fast wing beat, glide, and then dips. So kind of this wave, skylark, which is obviously uh, quite erratic uh, flight up into the sky, which is does during the song flight, and then it's back down to earth and then the feral pigeon and obviously it's quite amusing because the pairing is the, uh, just diving into the into the, peg, uh, the pigeon um, so thinking about call song and mimicry um the there is a difference between call and song um the call is actually uh so the call is the short uh simple uh uh, sound that you'll hear when a bird is alarmed generally uh, is usually used during courtship or aggress uh, aggression um, but it, it, there are several calls and there's a few examples there contact call flock call so you can uh, imagine uh, wild, uh, wildfowl uh, in flight in a stain which is the v, uh, v shaped flight formation of uh, geese for example they tend to be calling as they're flying. It's a communication to, to keep them all in uh, uh, instead. Um, you know, alarm call if they, if, or, or warning call if, if they've seen or heard a predator, then that sound, uh, you know, if you've ever, you've probably been threatened by a blackbird as you're walking through a woodland, as it darts out of a hedgerow somewhere and that sort of really loud burst uh, of, uh, call, but that's the call. And then you know, the song is the more complex, long sound generally made by the male um, to attract a female and uh, to maintain uh, territory, generally done from a state positioning position where it can be seen and heard by uh, females, sometimes in a song point, though. the exception being a robin, uh, where both females and males establish territories, and also corny owls, the it's the duet where you, the, 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 you know, the twit or, uh, is famously the male and the two is the female. It's more than that. It's the, the, you know, uh, the, the who and the who, 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 who. Uh, you've got the male and the female sort of communicating together then. Um, the other thing is non-vocal uh, calls. So a woodpecker drumming, that initially uh, may be seen as uh, digging for food or creating a hole to nest in, but actually as a way of communication and uh, the drumming is to ward off uh, potential uh, competitors. Um, 
worn off, sorry. Uh, then nightjar wing clapping. Wood pigeons do it as well as they fly. They clap their wings together. And that is a way of communicating. Um, yeah. Uh, mimicry is the other one. So sometimes uh, it can be deceiving. You may think you're hearing a particular bird. Actually, not just starling, but they are uh, famous for it, uh, mimicking bird songs. Uh, starlings have uh, about 75 a repertoire, 75 different birds in their, in their bird song uh, repertoire, but other birds do it as well. Uh, some of our most common birds mimic other birds' uh, songs, so you might not be hearing what you think you're hearing. Um, this one, I'm hoping this is uh, going to play, just let me know if it doesn't, but this is a starling. Uh, there are lots of starlings in the USA. Uh, the injured ones get taken in by uh, wildlife rescue rescuers and then they teach them to talk. So you're going to hear a lady talking to a starling here, but the starling responds. Um, and that. so that's just to give an example of the you know, extraordinary capabilities that some birds have. Um, so, yeah, just before I move on to upland birds, um, the thing with song is, is remembering them. And that is a question I get asked a lot. How do you remember what birds look like? How do you remember how they sound? Um, well, some make it easy for us. Uh, woodpeckers literally peck wood. Uh, black birds are black, that's a handy one. Um, you know, white folks have white folks. Um, however, oyster catchers don't eat oysters. They eat mussels, cockles and worms. So it can be a bit confusing. <coughs> some birds uh, through song make it quite easy. So some are onomatopoeic, which means that the, they've been named after their song. So cuckoo. That's a handy one. Chiff Chaff and Kitty Wake are good examples. So that is an easy way of remembering them. But it really is quite tricky sometimes. However, there are a few books um, that I would recommend uh, to help with remembering um, bird songs. Uh, Treat of the Day, which is a book uh, published um, as a result of the Radio 4 uh, programme. And I like it because it's a page or two pretty much most birds you'll see and hear and you can and it gives you a bit of a description of what to listen for and how to remember them. The other one is bird watching with your eyes closed uh, like sun and bounds and that can be quite handy uh, about remembering birds on. The only thing is some of the descriptions are a bit unusual so I'll give you a few examples. Wood pigeon, the way of remembering it is Take two cows taffy. So take two cows taffy. Five stones. Hoo 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 hoo. That was my impression. I hope that's it. Uh, the difficulty is that collared dove has a similar uh, song. However, it's three tones. Hoo hoo hoo. And the way of just remembering that, according to the sound of the book, is united. United. Now, the issue with that is that that's all well and good, but how do you remember that Take Two's Cow, Take Two Cows Taffy is a wood pigeon and United is a power dove? If you do, then great. Uh, but if I'm honest, I've invented my own uh, vocabulary or way of remembering bird songs. And I think that for you, for you personally, it's better to create your own because. Um, you know, it's um, it's very difficult to remember all of the ways that I put in this book. But uh, wood pigeon is I'm a wood pigeon, so it has wood pigeon in the name, and then collar dove is is you know is my way. You invent your own, because like I say, these are my personal ways of remembering. But you, I think creating your own is a good is a good way of remembering. Um, so on to upland birds, and uh, the picture there is of a red grouse. Now that's a classic upland bird, isn't it? Um, not often seen in Gwent, but actually there is, uh, there are red grouse to be found in Gwent. Uh, quite the most celebrated population in the UK uh, is at the Orange, actually. And in fact, they have been seen 
uh, near the Rassal estate, so just going into the Brecon Beacons uh, in Edward Vale. So that is a classic upland bird, uh, ground nesting on heath moorlands. Um, uh, you know, so quite a large bird. Uh, so an upland bird, you know, generally you'd think of it being small because they're ground nesting, but not always. Um, they, you know, they. The class, the birds I'm talking about this evening are going to be classically upland birds but in Gwent. So I mean, there'll be no ptarmigans or golden eagles, I'm afraid. But you know, you'll either see uh, these birds, you can see these birds at some point of the year in Gwent. Um, you, you may, they may not be breeding, but they overwinter here, so that's something to think about as well. Um, but you know, these are birds that predominantly nest on the ground. Uh, not always, some nest in trees, uh, but regardless of size, these nests on the ground. But, um, you know, some birds have adapted uh, to new habitats. So some of the birds you might see in this presentation, you might think, well, that's not an upland bird. I see those in other locations. But prior to urbanisation, so most of these birds uh, were historically uh, to be found in uplands. So, yeah, sorry, just... The next one. So here are some wetland birds um, that breed um in the uh, in the uplands um some of these may not breed in gwent i, I suspect they do um but you're more likely to see these on the coastline uh, of gwent um so you've got dunlin top left golden plover uh, snipe and curlew um so like i said these are breeding birds uh, but they they breed predominantly in uplands uh, so these are birds, I just got to try to make sure I can play the sounds on these. Uh, so wading birds are quite hard to identify the rest. So I've got the sound, I'm just going to go through them, I'll play the sound just to give you an idea um, of um, what they sound like. So this is the gunman. Uh, this is golden plover. Uh, the snipe. It's not the sound in the background, it's the end. And then the curlew. Um, so the curlew there, that, that, that one, you know, you'll hear that uh, uh, on uplands, uh, you know, that, that brrr, brrr, and on, on, you know, on, on coastlines as well. Very famous uh, sound that. Um, so the next slide, sorry. Um, so. Birds of prey, as it again, pretty much found everywhere, but historically an upland bird actually. Nests in trees, but also on rocky crags. And this is the thing upland habitats um, are generally in the UK uh, 250 to 300 meters above sea level. Um, and there's a variety of habitats that you will find, including woodlands, but uh, heather. Um, Heather moorlands, uh, heathlands, that's heather moorlands, uh, rocky crags, uh, bogs, uh, and um, rough grassland. Also in this area, uh, colliery spoil heaps. Now, rocky crags are very um, sought after nesting locations for buzzards, as well as peregrines, also kestrels. So actually, if you've got rocky crags, in upland areas, then they are nesting locations for, for, for these birds. Um, so um, peregrines, so buzzards, the difference being that buzzards do build a nest using twigs. Peregrines don't really build a nest, they just lay their eggs on a flat surface. So um, uh, 
but you know anywhere where there is uh, a cliff maybe or a quarry uh, we, as, you know that is an upland uh, that's in an upland habitat so it's probably an upland bird peregrines obviously you know are now found in cities um hundreds of them in london uh, because buildings act like rocky ledges um what else have we got here yeah, so these are two ground nesting birds of prey, short eared owl and a hen harrier. So, again, the, in Gwent, unlikely, but these are birds you can see on our coastlines uh, during the winter hunting. Uh, the hen harrier being the most, one of the most persecuted uh, birds in the UK. Uh, Mid Wales, perhaps, but Gwent, I, I doubt, even if they were, I mean, revealing those locations uh, would not be wise. Um, crows and ravens, so, um, you know, famously upland uh, birds, these look very similar. Uh, so the, the crow is a bit smoother, the raven's a bit shaggier, the size-wise raven is much bigger with a broader beak as well. But the, the, the songs are the, are, the, are the way to tell the difference between these, so I've got them here. So that's the crow. Raven is a bit deeper. Uh, so knowing the, the, the songs there can be really useful in telling the difference between those birds. Um, then we've got stone chat, wind chat and wheat ear. Uh, stone chat is a UK resident here all year. Um, again, found in many different habitats, but loves nesting uh, near gorse. and it, its, it's favourite place to perch and sing is gorse bushes, so they're generally found in uplands. Um, so yeah, they are um, an upland bird as well as being in other habitats, obviously. Uh, then we've got Winchat, which is some visitor to the UK, very similar uh, in appearance to, to stone chat. Doesn't have on, in the male, sorry, the, the top row there is the female uh, of the species, and then the bottom row is the male of the, of the species. Uh, but obviously the male sun chat has a bit more of a red breast there. Um, so the wind chat arrives in April and May, so they'll be arriving soon. Wheat here is a little bit earlier, it tends to arrive in March actually, so if you go in uplands now, you may be uh, lucky enough to see wheat here. All three of these birds present in, in Gwent. Uh, ring oozel, I mentioned earlier, I got a photograph of one of those up on the British. Um, member of the thrush family, uh, very similar in shape and size to blackbird, but a little bit uh, slimmer, not quite as uh, stocky. So again, a summer visitor to the UK, nests on craggy, sort of rocky outcrops, similar to the birds of prey I was speaking about earlier, but sometimes on, uh, on the floor um, underneath a bush. Pipe again, you see these everywhere, particularly in supermarket car parks, but actually historically in upland birds, um, you know, Breeds in open countryside, including uh, upland moors, nested holes. Um, so walls, dry stone walls, are sort of a uh, good place for these to find these uh, birds. Now I'm going to focus on these three for a little bit because uh, these are uh, skylark, meadow pipit, and tree pipit. All three you can see in Gwent. Uh, two of which were pretty much guaranteed. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed, where's the sea on Saturday at Silent Valley? Skylark, Meadow Piffet. Um, the, these three are the epitome of little brown jobbies or LBJs. So, you know, visually very similar. Um, difficult to, to separate, but all three found in upland areas. Um, the, the Skylark is the larger of the three, actually, just a little bit. Uh, smaller than a starling, um, so just a tiny bit smaller than a you know. So that is a sort of key feature. The crest uh, is another defining feature, as if the crest is up. But, um, you know, the, the real difference is the, the song. Um, um, the other, sorry, sorry, just before I get to the song, the, these three have a song flight, which is really handy. The Skylark song flight is a bit more erratic uh, than Mary Pippet's. Tree Pippet actually tends to sing from the top of a tree but does have a song flight. So the two, the Skylark and the Meadow Pippet, 
have a song flight. The menu pivot tends to go up in a straight line and come down in a straight line. Not always, the skylark goes up in a bit more of an erratic way and it flutters its wings quite, quite quickly and uh, can spend quite a long time. In fact, it keeps on going up to the point where it suddenly disappears out of sight and can stay in its song flight for about 10 minutes. So that's kind of a nice feature to remember to, to tell the difference between Skylark and Menopivit. Um, Menopivit is generally the go-to, it's the most common of the three, but actually in this area, I would argue with that. Across the UK, the thing with, with uh, figures and numbers is that they're generally UK-wide. Um, Skylark is declining, but actually around this area, there are lots. And whenever I got to the Uplands, um, Marlam, Sino Valley, the British, it tends to be Skylark is the more common bird. But um, I'm going to play the songs now just so you can get to grips with those. So this is the Skylark. So like its song, like its flight, the song is a bit erratic and random. The, when the tone drops, that tends to be when it's um, descending from its song flight. So you get the zoo, 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 zoo as it comes down. Let's pause that. Um, this is, if I can find it, excuse me a second. Meadow pipit. I just have to move some things around me, sorry about it. This is the meadow pipit. A bit more rhythmic and then as it comes down it kind of peeps at the end the tone goes up and then as it comes back down to earth it kind of the tone drops sensibly going up and then do 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 as it comes back down and then this is the tree pivot This one, I think, is so similar to chaffing. The kind of cricket fast bowler, the running down the d d d d d d d d. The difference is that it's got this has got a, at the end, whereas the chaffing tends to have a bit of a zip. That's the difference there. So that's the three calls, uh, the three songs sorry, of uh, those little brown hobbies. Um, on Saturday, we, you know, I hopefully will be able to see the song flights of the Skylark and Meadow Pivot. Um, yeah, that's the, the the kind of key features really to, to look out for. In terms of the behaviour, um, the Meadow Pivot is a very nervous bird. Uh, it flicks its tail quite a lot. Um, when on the ground, you can see, even when moving, the tail flicks and it's always on the lookout. The tree pivot tends to be a bit more confident in the way it moves. That's another sort of um, way of telling the difference between those. On to Silent Valley now. Um, so here's some birds that um, you may see at Silent Valley for those that are coming on the walk. Um, I'm just going to go through these quickly because I'm conscious of the time. Uh, this is just to give you an idea really. So Red Start might be a bit early for some of these, but you know, this is, if you go up Silent Valley in the coming months, these are things that you, you see pretty quickly all year round. Red Start might be a bit early for those. Linnets tend to move around depending on the time of year. Uh, green woodpecker, gold, uh, great spotted woodpecker, and nuthatch are there all year. Um, Puku, obviously, that is a summer visitor to the UK, so you might be lucky enough to, to see or hear them. Jay are there all year round. Uh, song thrush, missile thrush, and woodcock. Every time I go up there, there's just one woodcock. We've named, uh, named it Woody. Funny enough, but um, there always seems to be one around there. Not necessarily, uh, these are not necessarily upland birds, but these are birds that you'll see at um, um, Silent Valley. And I, that's pretty much it. Um, there are a few other birds that appear in uplands that I haven't included. Less of black back gull um, and common gull are historically um, upland birds. Uh, but like I say, they've kind of adapted for more, uh, for different habitats, you know, less black-backed gulls in urban areas in particular. Um, 
So, so yeah. So thanks for listening. Um, I hope that gives you a bit of an insight. Like I said, it is a beginner's guide, so I, I, I'm not going into too much detail, but some of the key features of the birds there, uh, I try to just discuss in order to help a little bit. Um, thank you. I just want to say thank you to all the contributing photographers and sound recordists. And if anyone has any questions, I'm going to stop recording. Um,